Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us for um, this next conversation, Connie Conversations, where we'll be discussing um, how uncertainty impacts decision making. Uh, I'm here, as usual, with Chris Moore, Associate Director of the Connie Institute for Brain Science, um, and I'm Diane Lipscomb. Um, and our two guests, Emily Oster and Amitai Shenoff, and I'm going to give a quick introduction to both of them before we um, kick off and get going. I did want to remind everyone that if you want to post any questions um, during the discussion, please use the Q&A feature, which is, a, everybody's used to this now at the bottom of your screen, um, and then we will, um, Chris and I will, will take a look at those and um, we'll be picking up questions from that Q&A. Thanks. So uh, this is, I mean, honestly, just such a thrill to um, be able to get uh, Emily and Amitai together. Um, and, you know, I, I think when we think about these, putting together these conversations, we, you know, just think, Chris and I think, well, who, where are the brilliant people? <laughs> and what would be incredible fun for both of us? Um, and, well, uh, we've, you know, we've been thinking about bringing you two together for quite some time. And so we're really thrilled that we could uh, do this. It's, um, you know, thinking about you know, a brilliant economist and a brilliant cognitive scientist um, focusing on how uncertainty impacts decision making um, is, I think, going to be um, one of the highlights, certainly, of my month. <laughs> Emily Oster is a Royce Family Professor of Teaching Excellence and Professor of Economics, um, and also a member of the Watson Institute for uh, International and Public Affairs. And uh, barely needs any introduction, but um, I just want to kind of underscore, um, you know, what a phenomenal economist Emily is, as well as a kind of very public figure now <laughs> with her with her best-selling um, books. But has you know really um, done some really fabulous work. Um, covering kind of issues around HIV and gender equality and health and survival. Um, and also um, has had recent, um, relatively recent papers on Huntington's disease, which is an area that she explored in kind of health information um, and asking why individuals at risk population are, are resistant to information, inf informative genetic information about the disease. And so I, I want to just kind of really underscore what a tremendous um, uh, scholar and, and, and uh, economist uh, Emily is. And we've certainly um, quite interested as well in the, um, Emily's work in being able to uh, convey kind of complex decision-making steps um, and, and to really synthesize that, make it really understandable. And uh, it was clear that the world was waiting for Emily's publications. It's a best-selling New York Times best-selling author of um, you know, three major books right now, Expecting Better, Kripshi, and The Family Firm. Um, and also, as I just discovered, which I hadn't completely realized, that Emily also puts out parent data <laughs> newsletter about twice a week. So um, just, uh, I think, a, a real great service to, to do that, um, but a, a phenomenal communicator. And so we're really, really thrilled, Emily, to have you join us. Uh, Watson joins Carney. It's, it's <laughs> going to be fun. Um, Amitai Shenov is an assistant professor in the uh, Department of Cognitive, Linguistic and Psychological Sciences and also a member of the Kanye Institute for Brain Science. Um, and Amitai, uh, you know, is doing some really super exciting work examining the computational neural mechanisms at the intersection between decision making and cognitive control. Um, and with a particular focus on how we as individuals kind of weigh the cost and benefit of engaging in cognitively demanding tasks. Um, Amitai, for his work, is, he was awarded the Association of Psychological Science Rising uh, Star Award, which um, uh, I'm well deserved, very, very well deserved. And his, his, his work and his lab, um, just really uh, very, very interesting and very topical right now. So kind of most relevant, as I said, to, to the discussion today is Amitai's work on the kind of the mental resources needed to perform um, tasks and accomplish goals. Um, and he's looked at the variability across individuals um, in their ability to perform tasks and degree to which they succeed. And we're gonna get into, I think, talking a lot more detail about what, what, what do you mean Amitai by effort, <laughs> mental effort um, associated with, um, with decision-making. 
So um, that's my quick introduction. And um, I'm going to kind of kick off. Chris and I will go back and forth, but I thought that I would just kick off and ask you guys to introduce yourselves and perhaps tell us something. I'll start with Emily um, and then uh, we'll go to Amitai. But if you could just give um, the audience a sense of how your own research or more generally how your discipline approaches like the problem we pose. It's like, how do we make decisions in, in times of, of incredible uncertainty? Um, would, would love for you to just kind of lay some foundation and framework for that. Well, thanks, thanks again for organizing this, Nan and, and Chris. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so I'm, I'm Emily Astor, I'm, uh, I'm an economist here. Um, so, you know, I think when, when economics thinks about decision making kind of at, at the top, we sort of think about the idea of weighing costs and benefits. And I think in, in some ways that seems obvious, but I actually think that piece of it, the idea that sort of every choice has risks and benefits has come up a lot in the last year. And I think it's one of the things that economists have been talking about differently than some other, than some other groups. So we have this sort of basic underlying, we're going to weigh costs and benefits. Uh, and then there's a sort of second stage, like, when I teach micro to students, it's like, okay, well, what if those aren't sure, right? What if it's a, it's not like the tuna sandwich and, you know, $3 and I can like, but what if I'm not sure, like, do I like the tuna sandwich? Um, what if it has pickles in it? Uh, you know, and, and so then we have, need some framework to, um, we think about whether that would be good or bad with the pickles, Chris. Uh, we need some framework to, to accommodate that uncertainty. And we, we have frameworks where people, Sort of think about okay, there are you know two states of the world, and and there's the I like the tuna, I don't like the tuna, thirty percent, forty percent. You multiply them. We take into we have some sort of modeling approaches to that. So we have some very clear frameworks for how you would think about decision making under uh, under uncertainty. I think the the place where things are more challenging for those frameworks are is the place where you can't say what the, the variation in states are, or you have trouble putting percentages, you know, probabilities on them, or you have trouble understanding the probabilities that are put on them, or you can't really think about what their, their payouts are, right? So economic decision-making tends to rely on the idea that we have complete information, that I can tell you exactly all of the possible states of tuna fish sandwich enjoyment, exactly their probability, exactly how many utils they would give me, and I can multiply them, and then I can compare that to $4 and decide if I want to do it. And of course, we understand that's not always how the world is, but as things move further and further from that paradigm, it becomes more and more challenging. And this is a topic many people in economics work on, sort of how, how do you do decision-making under uncertainty when people don't know the probabilities or are bad with the probabilities? And so I think that's a little bit of the frame that I, I come into um, a lot of the work that I do um, is almost to say, okay, in a, in a lot of actual choices that we make in the world, we are going to want to make choices in a way that is rational, but we are going to come up against uh, some of these problems. And so, in fact, I would say I've spent much of the last year trying to help people understand what probabilities mean and how they can actually use them in their decision making in a way that is, um, that is productive. And we can sort of talk more talk more about that. But I think that's the communication challenge that I see is I, I can see how you should make the choices, but it's hard to make the choices when you can't conceptualize these sort of P's and U's that you're supposed to be multiplying in this amazing framework that we made up to think about tuna sandwiches, but now needs to be applied to like play dates and kids at school and all of the other COVID, uh, COVID things. So, um, so that's kind of my, my big picture intro. Is that good, Diane? Is that sufficient? Okay. It's fantastic. Thank you very much. So I'm going to just immediately kick over to Amitai to kind of pick up on some of those themes that, that you introduced, Emily. But Thank you. Um, so first, thank you again for inviting me to be part of this, especially alongside Emily Oster's work I've been following since she was writing for 538. So thank you for all the enlightenment. Um, <laughs> it was like 4,000 years ago, so thank yeah, you. Yeah, well. <laughs> Um, so I think, you know, as a cognitive affective neuroscientist, um, I think my viewpoint and my field's viewpoint is, is very much complementary to, to what Emily just laid out. We tend to think things more about kind of what people do than what they should do. Um, and in particular, kind of under the hood, what's happening in terms of information processing and how things are being represented along that pathway that eventually results in a decision and a response. And so, um, you know, if I could kind of use a, a toy model for a second in terms of, you know, how we think about this weighing cost benefits 
reference, which is kind of similar to what how Emily laid it out, you can kind of think about the traditional example of like having scales and kind of marbles, you know, appear on, on either side of that and eventually kind of like one of those ends falls over and you make a decision. So um, that's actually not it turns out not a terrible model for how people make decisions. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but like in terms of kind of modeling the, the process. But I also like that in terms of kind of um, laying out the general kind of taxonomy of like what are the systems involved in a decision. So it's a it's really a whole brain affair. So we can think about first of all what are the systems that bring those marbles onto the scale. So we have sensory systems, kind of how we. Um, uh, explore our environment, how we kind of think about the relevant kind of um, uh, tastes and smells and so on. Um, memory systems, how we kind of pull things from episodic memory, relevant context, um, when we're kind of imagining what kind of tuna sandwich this might be, where it's, it came from, and so on. Um, and, you know, uh, dear to my heart, the, the kind of affective and emotional systems that kind of give meaning to that information, kind of those marbles. Um, then on the opposite end, and probably what we won't really talk much about today is kind of once one of those falls over, there's the kind of motor system and, and the autonomic system that kind of implements it. But in between those, there's also a system that we're also very interested in my lab, um, which kind of oversees and helps to regulate that kind of decision-making process, what's going on, on along those scales. And so part of that is kind of tuning, um, you know, do we want to adjust the screws on this so it uh, is more rigid or more nimble so it falls over more easily or not depending on the kind of relative weight of marbles or weight of evidence and then there's this whole other system that i think is really relevant to this conversation that kind of looks at here's the amount of um, uncertainty so these are have been sitting here at the same spot for a while what other systems do we want to engage um, and so to come back that was a little bit of a detour but diane to come back to your original question in terms of where uncertainty comes in our responses to it there's at least kind of two layers at which we can kind of think about. One of them is the uncertainty in the kind of marbles that we're kind of drawing from. We're kind of imagining future outcomes. And, you know, unlike sandwiches, a lot of the cases we're going to be talking about are much more abstract and much more uncertain things that we often have never experienced. How do we explore that uncertainty and kind of draw the relevant evidence? How do we deal with that? Then there's the uncertainty with having to do with this decision process. If I'm in a situation where I just can't decide um, what do I do? What other kind of systems are going to come online? What is the kind of affective experience associated with that? That was really fabulous introduction, a good framing for us to be able to kick off. Um, I, I want to introduce kind of another um, element. And Emily, you mentioned uh, when you both did that, Emily, kind of more directly like the, this, you, there's a number of, of things you have to consider and like you give, give different pieces different weight weighting how do you like get that weighting right um or or how do you train yourself in order to to to, to make maybe better decisions maybe not but um and i think that we you know we've all seen situations the other day i was actually <laughs> walking along by college hill and i saw two um, undergraduate age <laughs> students careering down College Hill. I mean, we all know how steep that is. Um, on those little e electron, these little electric scooters with no helmets on. Okay, brain scientists. Yes. Okay, but but like no helmet on. But they were wearing masks. And so like I, it was like that 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 moment just like struck me because normally I'd be like, oh, they should be wearing masks. But like, but they but they should be wearing helmets. But like. But they're wearing masks like so there was this decision making that went into like there's some risk out there but it wasn't about the brain <laughs> and and so like it just seems so off kilted and so maybe it, it kind of be fun for you both to talk about like this you know the the you know the, this moment that we're in like of course in the pandemic and, and and it's just obsessing we're just completely obsessed about this and of course we should be because there's risk out there but that, that just seems so off balance, so misaligned in terms of, of what is the risk? Well, the risk is that they'll fall off and crack, crack their head. So it, it, maybe, maybe that's not a good introduction or, or a step for you to kind of talk about it, but I'd like to talk about like the assignment of waiting um, and uh, a little bit more um, and how we kind of mitigate the, um, or, or try to assign the right kind of waiting to decision making. Like. For me, so it's, it's interesting because I, there's a lot of places where I um, where I think of sort of what you're what you're saying is basically like these people are doing an activity. They're taking two they're like and and their behavior is out of whack. Like we sort of we think that it should be like you have some like protection of self from mortality that we like 
we, we act like we don't want to die. We like put some weight on that. And that everything we do should be sort of consistently a, appropriate in terms of like pre preventing that. And what you're saying is like this activity is, is not consistently consistent because the chance that you get COVID, first of all, this is a fully vaccinated population. Like the, the chance that you get COVID outside on a scooter, given that you're a fully vaccinated, like is, is basically, you know, zero. And the chance that you fall down and crack your head, as far as I can tell, is like 75%. Um, so that's like very, that's very inconsistent. You know, for me, that particular thing feels like, okay, just everyone's wearing a mask all the time. And that, that's reflective of some kind of habit, right? And I, maybe, maybe I'm a time, maybe this is sort of related to like, we can't make every decision all the time. So I think some of what's happened with things like masking or some of these sort of light touch interventions is just like, look, I, I can't think every moment, is it worse on the scooter or not on the scooter? Like, I just, I have it on, I pulled it up, I didn't pull it up. Like, you know, I'm just not thinking about that uh, any anymore. Maybe the helmet's like that too. Um, but I, I do think that there are there are scenarios sort of in this space where we are clearly treating COVID totally differently than other illness risks, other, you know, other kinds of risks that we are, uh, that we're encountering. And we're sort of thinking about, um, you know, I mean, think about like the flu vaccine. There are a lot of people who are like, I'm not going to get the, the flu vaccine. And even though I was like lining up to be the first person in line to get, to get a COVID vaccine, the, like for some sets of some age groups, that's actually really in, like, that's totally inconsistent. Like both of those things are really bad. Um, and you should sort of get get both of them, and yet somehow because it's like well, but nobody really gets the flu. It's like no, people always. What are you talking about? Like people always get the flu, and I think that that because it, there's a sort of salience. Um, that's uh, the way I think about it. Is it's like salient, and so it's making the probability seem higher. But I'm interested, I'm in how you would think about how you think about that, and is that like what, what about where is the marble, which marble bucket? Yeah, I mean, I think you raise a good point. First, uh, I mean, in, in the kind of marble analogy, there, there's a, an important distinction that we tend to think about um, in terms of kind of more automatic processes that like in a sense kind of put their thumb on, on, on a scale of one of these sides. And so there's kind of two flavors of those. One are kind of response oriented things, habits, rituals, default kind of heuristics, um, things that kind of like when we're in this environment, here's the action we take. And then there's more kind of like emotionally charged reactions that we have in a given environment. Um, and those can also kind of push a certain kind of response. I'm just going to avoid this entirely because I had this bad experience here. Um, so that kind of describes the, 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 the backdrop of the mechanisms. What's going on in these cases? I mean, Diana, I suspect the person you're talking about has never had their, has never cracked their head in that situation. If they did, they would change their behavior. So, you know, ultimately for all the things we're talking about, they're imagining potential future outcomes and the salience or likelihood of those and how much we care about those. So if somebody thinks that getting a flu is, the flu is either unlikely or just not something that's going to affect them much, and that's certainly played in early on in, in perceptions of COVID, then that's not going to lead them to kind of put in the work to go and get their flu shot. Um, and I mean, there's interesting work. This is a bit of an aside on um, how we represent these probabilities as kind of more like mathematical values versus more like affectively charged information. And your, your point reminded me of that because there's this work, and I don't know how, how far this has been taken or if it's been replicated, but in adolescence that kind of showed that it turns out in kids and adolescents, they're actually not bad at estimating risks. They, they, if anything, kind of overestimate risks numerically, um, but they don't have the same kind of affective charge to something that we as adults do. We don't, we have like a kind of like instinctive response. So, you know, the, the, a favorite example of mine is if you ask a kid whether it's a good idea to like drink bleach, like that takes them a little bit longer to say, no, that's not a good idea. Whereas like we have like this kind of immediate kind of response. So, I mean, coming back to um, Emily's point, there, there's sort of like a habitual nature to this. And you know, here I'm, I'm totally speculating, but I think there, there's also like some kind of like morally or affectively charged part of some of these kind of rules that we're learning, especially associated with, with masks. Um, and for me, the association that, that often comes to mind is, you know, as a kid, I, I, I kept kosher and I, I don't have any kind of religious like uh, connection in that in that way anymore, but I still have the same kind of like, you know, when I see pork, I have like the same kind of in instinctive feeling like I learned this is a bad thing to do. Um, and so, you know, like in a sense, my Pavlovian system still keeps kosher, but I, I don't in a like rational sense. So um, I don't know how relevant that is, but I think like there's something similar about kind of like whether we've learned that a particular rule is, is, a, is a rule in a kind of meaningful sense or whether it's just something we do, you know, by, by habit in a, in a given environment. I also wonder in this sort of, so, so some of what I, I, I 
So I think that we've talked a little bit about the idea, like there's a lot of decisions and that like people get like sort of making this decision is cognitively costly. That's sort of like, there's all these marbles. And so, so I think one of the things that clearly we do have adapted to do is to have some of these heuristics, right? And that basically like, I can't make every decision. I have to have some, I, like I basically, my system likes rules, right? I like there to be a rule that I just wear the, wear the mask and like, I'm sort of drawn to some rule. I wear the mask, I don't wear the mask, whatever, because in familiar situations, because I have to do that. Because it can't be that every single day I decide every single thing that, you know, that, that I do. And so I, I kind of, I wonder how much in some of these things we've just like, you have to have something because you just can't do it every, you can't do it every minute. I, I mean, I think that's totally right. I mean, I, I think if we think about the counterfactual, like if we did that amount of estimation for all of our decisions, like, you know, whether to take ibuprofen in the situation and so on, like we, we just do tend to trust authorities and that helps us kind of, because they've done the deliberation for us and we, we can kind of rely on that um, for setting policies for ourselves. The fact that kind of COVID stands out as like a kind of distinct from all other medical decisions that, that people tend to make is, is interesting, I think. In but yeah, there's, a, there's a piece of that that it's because it stands out and because it's new, I think it has drawn people, I mean, this is probably a little off topic, it has sort of drawn people into like, this is something that I should make my own, like I, like, I almost wonder how much that contributes to like the distrust of, of that's like, this is so new, like you don't know anything new about it. And I think communication has also been very poor, but this, I was thinking about this phrase, like, you know, there's a lot of, there's like a number of unvaccinated players in the NBA. And one of the things they frequently keep saying is, um, is you know, I'm doing my own research on it. And, and that phrase, like I'm doing my own research. People say, what is that? What, you know, what do you mean you're doing your own, own research? Like what, but I think there is very much a feel of like, of like, this is something that I can engage. I am gonna need to engage more with these decisions and not just listen to, you know, what this expert is, is saying. And partly I wonder if that's just because they're all really new. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think this directly relates to the idea of motivated cognition, which I, I think like we kind of use that as a, as a phrase as though it's its own thing, but all cognition is in a sense motivated. Like we, we only make decisions with a particular kind of goal and incentives in mind. And so to the extent we, it's almost, you know, surprising that we, we collect as much information we do about certain kinds of um, um, certain, you know, decisions like this rather than kind of just relying on, on others. And so I think in this case, if, if you have information you can draw on or other people like somebody's you know, friends, cousin, and so on kind of tells you, this is the, you know, this is what I heard, then you just have that kind of to rely on. And then everything else is sort of abstract and you don't have something we haven't really gotten to yet is there is no, for, for most people, there's just no direct experience with COVID per se, or the relevant kind of like respiratory outcomes. And for some people who have it, there's kind of benign um, outcomes. So in the absence of that, I, I think that people can draw on whatever, you know, the, the, they're motivated to in terms of making their decisions. I was going to say, I love that. I hadn't actually occurred to me that, um, doesn't matter who they were, but like the, the people are just like, are just putting masks on now because like, it's the easy, it, it's just like the easiest thing to do. And I was imagining, and that's why this conversation was great. But, but to me, this is like really pretty extraordinary that, there's a culture shift like in in a relatively short period of time and you know when we think about like how do you that's one of the hardest things to do is like change culture and so anyway I there's there's something there's something in there about like the effort that it that that is needed in order to think about doing something and you're saying Emily like you're probably just not thinking about it anymore because like this is a thing that's done here so anyway I think it's like really interesting spin on this so Chris go over to you <laughs> over to you make this too but I, I i've had that experience a lot that as soon as we decided COVID was risky then there's just a bunch of rules and stuff you did with groceries and doors and and i was fine as soon as i got those rules set down and i had i could stop running the <laughs> as soon as i could turn away my neurotic uh, calculator that i bring to problems that i view as threatening or exciting um but it was but and then at, after i got vaccinated and i had to come back physically to work as soon as you make the switch, it's a lot easier to be in a mode. And then that's just the mode. You're going to wear a mask, you're going to teach in front of class, and it's just the way it is. The anxiety really, from an affective point of view, the anxiety comes in in those in-between times when you're not sure what the norm is and you're just not sure what the rails are. Um, maybe I'm saying something obvious, but it's really visceral, that feeling of like, yeah, I'm okay being exposed to people. That's cool. That's just the way it is now. 
And it wasn't that way a year ago because that's how we kept the, the numbers down. It's a really vivid, uh, it's a really vivid set shift. Uh, that I mean, I think there's like sort of two things that that draws out. So one is is the 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 sort of mental load of making the making those shifts the first time, right? That sort of like and and in particular in this sort of moment of recognizing like you're going to go to work and you might get a break. Like you might if you if you leave your house, like you will have more exposure to the coronavirus than you did before, and you're going to have to like mentally in order to be able to do that and to kind of re-engage, you have to accept some risk that you've spent now, you know, a year or whatever, like thinking is the worst possible thing. And I think that, that, that is hard. And we, and we kind of, I think it's, I, and I don't know exactly how to think about why it's hard, but it's clear, like we've sort of got these rules and these guardrails and whatever it is. And then to be, to be able to send be like, okay, actually, you know what, like COVID is just like, it's going to go in this other bucket, the like bucket of other things. That's really, really challenging for people. I don't have a good sense of how much I, why is that? Um, well, I don't, I actually was gonna follow up on that by by, um, by pointing to situations I think are legitimately, for, for those of us who are, who are parents, especially young kids, I think like that's been the biggest kind of difficulty, you know, at least in my experience and talking to other people in my situation, because there's a set shift in part of our world when we're around other adults. And there's like the decisions around kids, which I know Emily has spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, and I kind of wonder, I'm going to throw this back to you, like, you know, to, when I talk to friends about this, it almost feels like we're kind of like in quantum states between like jumping between like feeling like it's not a big deal to like have our kids be in these kind of situations and like feeling like, you know, this is going to be the worst possible. Like, you know, there, there's no kind of middle ground in, in between those. And I don't, I don't know if you, you, I know you get kind of questions from people all the time. Yeah, I mean, I think one of, so somebody, somebody wrote to me the other day and they said they had basically a version of a story, which was like, should I let my older vaccinated kid do activity Y? Um, and I'm worried about them bringing COVID home to younger, younger unvaccinated kid. And, and that, how should I, worry should I be? And the thing I said to them was like, look, you know, if, you know, the thing we worry about with getting sick is like putting aside issues of quarantine and school and so on. Like, if you're just saying like, I'm worried that somebody will get very sick. The person in your household you should be worried about is you. The fully vaccinated adult, your risk of getting of getting very sick is way higher than your unvaccinated six year old. And so now, like in some ways, that's part of this sort of like helping people think, like just say, okay, like it, I I agree, we've sort of gotten into this idea, and I'm not saying you shouldn't vaccinate your kid, but that that you are obviously processing, interacting yourself as like this is pretty safe, and you should be, it is, but you kind of need to shift that to your to the kid, and I think part of it is just as your when we have as parents, like we're so drawn to the, we're so drawn to the worst case with our kid. We're so drawn to the, like the fear. Um, and I think this with respect to kids, the fear system is like so central for everyone, right? People fight about, should we vaccinate our kids? It's the people who are afraid of COVID against the people who are afraid of vaccines. Everyone's really afraid. And that's part of why it's so, like they think that's part of why it's so challenging is that all of these kind of rational calculation, you know, et cetera, systems are overridden by the marble that's like something bad happens to my kid. And that marble, like as soon as I get my, that marble in my head, every other marble is like, like just, it's, it's infinitely costly, the infinitely costly marble. And that's, I think it's really hard to, to kind of walk people through how to make good decisions when one of the marbles feels infinite. Yeah, and I, I think I think how this ties into kind of work on just understanding the circuits of fear and anxiety is that what, what's happening there is, you know, in order to, to pull, draw on those marbles, we have to kind of like imagine some, some futures and, you know, as, as economists also kind of believe there's some kind of like perspective regret that we might have for a particular kind of decision. We kind of end up in this kind of worry rumination where we're kind of like stuck in like, here's a possible future where I'm thinking about the long tail risk of, you know, my kid might get, you know, COVID for, you know, with chronic symptoms and that, you know, what kind of parent would I be and, and so on. I, I imagine that's probably playing a role there. I mean, so one, one thing that comes up a lot as a parent is, and NPR luckily had a survey that proved it this morning, so now I know it's true, is a lot of us are just exhausted with the act of making all these decisions all the time, especially ones riddled with uncertainty where 
how deep should I dive into as a scientist, especially you feel guilty if you don't actually analyze the data that might go into some of these decisions. Like the amount of time I've spent thinking I knew something about the probabilistic curves and, you know, natural immunization or natural, like it, it is kind of exhausting. I, I wonder if some of the, the mask part is people are, you hinted at this, Emily, but maybe we can pick it up. Um, maybe people still have bandwidth for COVID if they view it as a really high priority, but it's just left them completely heuristic <laughs> or completely relying on a very base level. Well, that's enjoyable. I'll do that. I'm not going to think through the odds of anything else because I'm just exhausted from it. Um, again, around kids, that comes up a lot. And you were saying that, Amitai. Um, can you talk about that like pandemic decision fatigue, <laughs> how that might be factoring in for people as they're trying to navigate their way through this? I'm sorry, you want to start with that? Sure. I mean, well, I'll say I think it's even worse than that because I think like part of that decision making is not just decision making for yourself and for the people around you, but like how are other people going? I mean, especially when we're talking about masks and kind of public signaling like events, like how are other people going to evaluate what you did? And so I think that just reinforces whatever the norm is in the, in the culture, um, that just reinforces not diverging from it. So, you know, we talked about, um, you know, decision fatigue and the cost of making, um, of engaging in, in decisions, but the cost of overriding defaults in, in general um, is, you know, the, the mental effort associated with, you know, doing something that's different than what your, your kind of norm is or default for your environment um, is hefty. So that, that's not really an answer to your decision fatigue question, but Emily, I don't know if you have more thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think that there, you know, it's, I, it's, so for me, I think there's the decision, there's the decision fatigue with a lot of decisions people had to make that they weren't, they weren't expecting. The other piece of it is that all of these decisions feel terrible um, and feel like, and so, do you know, so like, you know, as, as people who kind of make decisions, like usually if they're important decisions, we kind of, at the end of them, like we, we tend to feel like, okay, I made, like I made a good choice. Like that was a, like, that was like a happy choice. And I wrote something last year about, Thanksgiving, where I was basically like, look, at the end of the day, you're either going to see your family and be anxious, or you're not going to see them and be sad. And there's no like secret option. See, there's only anxious and sad. And I think part of what has happened is a lot of our decisions end with like, in, in this sort of era, end with like, well, I have these two like pretty bad, like pretty bad seeming options. I can go to this play date and then like what, and then somebody might get COVID anyway, I'm going to be worried about it the whole time. Or I can not, and then my kid's going to be like, why don't I get to go to the play date? And, you know, they won't see their friends and like, just they're, they're not good. There's no like good, there's no good, no good. And I think we're, we're, though that makes decision making hard. And I think it makes it more exhausting because you keep thinking about it. Like, is there a secret option C? And there's sometimes I want to be like, no secret option C, just anxious and sad. And you just got to pick which one of those is, is good and, and kind of feel like you have to move, move on. But I think that, I think that's, that's contributing to the fatigue. Yeah, and I, I think part of the fatigue is also that, you know, when you're engaging and thinking about these options, there's kind of auxiliary networks that have to come online to basically regulate the emotions that you're having, because those are competing with other things you're trying to do. I'm sure all of us have a kind of experience like this kind of stress kind of impacts your working memory that re results in kind of additional um, mental effort. And so all of these things kind of reinforce, like if you have a default that's useful to you, even if it's not, even if it's imperfect or irrational in a lot of environments, um, it's, it's a heck of a lot better than having to deal with all that. So I actually really would love to pick up on this a little bit more, um, both of you, because we're, you're both talking about like fatigue and fatiguing something. <laughs> and like, is it fatiguing actually kind of metabolic energy? Like, uh, are you thinking, do you think about fatigue as a biological phenomena or is it something different from now of course it could be a number of different things and you you have kind of mental effort <laughs> but but we're talking about the, the fatiguing of <laughs> of of that, that uh, of of going through the same thing over and over and over again something changing i like the way that you i'm gonna tell you talked about like are the networks having to be engaged because i think about there's more energy is going to be needed in order to engage those and and like that if you if you imagine like there's a there's a constant amount of, of energy <laughs> like you, you're pulling to one system and so, something else is losing out so maybe could, I'd love to pick up on this idea of effort you know fatigue energy and and 
do you have in your mind, both of you, like this idea of a biological <laughs> energy, amount of energy that, that gets exhausted or not? Amate, what do you think? <laughs> well, so I'm, I'm smiling because this is, this is you've opened up a minefield in, in our area. And the short answer is we think no. Uh, we, we think like there, there's probably the, the evidence that, that there was kind of some kind of metabolic resource that's being drawn out by m mental effort or fatigue is pretty um, weak. Um, and so I'll, I'll give you kind of one of my favorite kind of alternatives. There's a lot of different accounts. We just don't know the answer. Um, but an alternative that I think is, is, is um, salient to me is, uh, is salient because I think it actually connects to this experience. So um, one potential explanation, this is um, work from Sebastian Muslik at, at Princeton who's coming to, to, um, to Brown soon, um, is on the, the kind of bottlenecks that result from information processing. So if you have multiple different kind of um, networks that are being involved that can be used for multiple things, that kind of creates kind of inherent opportunity costs. Um, and that means that, you know, using them for one task means you can't use them for others. And, and the bottom line is if you, one readout of that system is that more effort across different kind of pathways just basically results in more conflict across them. Um, so that doesn't answer the question of effort, but it, it does come back to what I kind of hinted at the beginning, which is one of the things that we kind of experience is particularly, you know, stressful and anxiety provoking is that conflict. I mean, we can just, it, it's at least easy enough for me to kind of envision when you have multiple options, you kind of feel pulled in multiple directions and you, there's, you know, a, a incredible work on this in, in multiple animal models and that's kind of those themselves kind of create paradigms for anxiety in humans and so you can kind of bring a lot of this back down to if you're if you kind of you know pour marbles on both sides or all the different sides of the scale you that's the the fatigue or the pressure you're, you're feeling might be something like that your body is kind of like being kind of pulled in multiple different directions in terms of literal kind of like action tendencies and that could be what we're kind of experiencing, but this is all at the level of speculation at this point. And I also wonder if there's a parallel to some of these studies where you like have people do a cognitive task or try to remember something while they're making another choice. Um, and that sort of, it's hard, like if I'm, if I'm sort of kind of like doing it, like if one part of I'm using my brain, I can't make as good choices on like these, so behavioral economics where like people's discount rates are higher or are higher when they're like trying to do another, like a math, remember some math in their head that they're gonna have to recover recover later. And so, you know, I, I sort of think about some of the other, um, some of the other things that you would be doing with those resources and, you know, some of the, almost the, almost some of the like health, even like health behaviors that people didn't during the, during the pandemic that like basically if I'm spending my entire day just like, you know, constantly thinking about how to avoid the coronavirus and what to do with my kids and how to homeschool and all this other stuff. Like, I do not have energy at the end of the day to be like, let's make good choices for dinner. Even if I had the physical energy to cook, I, I like the energy I have is to like eat a pile of crisps um, and, you know, drink like a half a bottle of wine. We have definitely seen or more like, we have definitely, I think, seen a fair amount of, of that. And I sort of, I wonder how much of that is almost reflective of of this kind of like, I just don't have the resources left to do this other, to exercise and do all, you know, do all this other stuff. I kind of like, I'm using them all on the coronavirus. So I'll just add, I mean, I have the exact same intuition still. And I say still because the, the reason for this, the mind field I mentioned is that some of the work you were mentioning is, hasn't been replicated or, or requires kind of, I think the best example I've seen of like that kind of cognitive fatigue in the lab producing like kind of like mm -hmm. the, those effects on, um, more impulsive choices took seven hours of like fatiguing a task and then you kind of see small effects. Now there's a major caveat that this is all like, you know, in lab experiments. Yeah. And I do, you know, with, with that caveat still kind of experience in my own life that, you know, I'm, when I'm fatigued and I come home, I'm like, you know, more impulsive choices. Um, so anyway, I, I think that the jury is true. Like, does that have to be true? I mean, I guess it doesn't have to be true, but I well, feel it's, it, it's so <clears> resonant <throat> as a person that you, that like when you come home and you're tired, you're not, you 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 just don't wanna like eat salad. Yeah, so it depends who you talk to. I, I think where the consensus though, there are still people who just think that this isn't a thing is that whether it's actually your resource or just motivation. Um, and I think like to the extent there's evidence that this exists, it's a motivational story rather than like literally you don't have the, the capacity for it. Um, but 
I, I mean, I, to some extent, the jury's still out. I mean, the, the limited motivation or kind of shifts in motivation still, I think, create the kind of problems that you're you're raising in life. Yeah, yeah, it's like the can't or won't phenomena of right. illness, right? It was it, there's some evidence that when people are bedridden with illness, it it has as much to do with a loss of say dopaminergic uh, upmodulation because their illness is affecting systems that create that as it does with the actual lack of ATP that they might be experiencing due to how they got sick. Um, I mean, it's, it's really interesting, not to jump it in, but you know, the brain takes 15 to 20% of our metabolic resources all the time right now, even without pushing it. And so it's a really good question whether it takes those and it just always has those. And it's always got this enormous budget. Maybe it's like the military or something. It's always got this enormous budget. So fluctuations around the degree of conflict isn't gonna drive it to a different regime because it's always getting so much of our energetic demand. On the other hand, it's the big hog that's drawing all of our metabolic resources at that ATP level or the oxygen level. And so, you know, there's a reason. It, it's costly to make that machine work in different ways. You, you can think about it both ways. And it, it's interesting to consider it. There isn't, there isn't an easy outcome when you think about the biology side of it. But that description, Chris, is I mean, I know that's not what you meant, but like you can't consider like the whole brain. I mean, like consuming energy, like the whole thing, like we're talking about a lot of different cell types, a lot of different, like I'm te this is what you study. <laughs> so there you go. But like, I mean, yeah, okay on average, but there's certainly micro fluctuations that could have profound impact on behavior. So, anyway. Right. Oh, absolutely. And it's, it's neat to think how those energy systems are part of the decision making right. as opposed to just the pizza delivery. Right. Um, right. I mean, I think if you're just looking at, on average, you're filtered out energy utilization in the brain. Yeah, mm -hmm. like that makes sense, like that it's not fluctuating wildly, but at a, at a single circuit synapse <laughs> level, uh, it could. I think this, I mean, just to enrich the kind of counter argument to that, or like what, you know, why this is a debate, I think the, the stock counter argument to that is that, you know, the systems that are drawing the most energy are the ones that are not typically associated with things like cognitive control or executive function, like watching Netflix requires a, a lot of metabolic resources for all parts of my brain, um, but then it's not, you know, creating the, the kind of drain or fatigue that we're, that we're talking about. So there's something special, it seems, about um, cognitive control and executive function. Um, that just that that's one of the kind of holes in the in the metabolic story at this point. Yeah, I mean, a, a point Diane was <clears throat> making earlier as we were thinking about it. So maybe you want to flesh this out, Diane. But you know, one of the great needs for sleep yeah. is to clear out all the metabolites you create from using your neurons, and that's not using your ATP per se, but certainly all these conflicting, you know, conflict resolution between multiple systems engaging more of them actively and more dynamics could be just creating more metabolites, which should create sleep pressure <laughs> because you need to get to the clearing your brain out phase. There's a lot of disagreements about all the things I just said, but that, that's another form of um, a way you'd want to index towards something like sleep, therefore create fatigue as a sensation, but it's not per se the loss of energy. It's, it's, a, different, it's a different level. And, and there is actually a, a, like a theory that um, Clay Holroyd put forward uh, called like the waste disposal hypothesis that basically is that, that like there's this amyloid that builds up that, that is, you know, the, co the result of all this cognitive control and, and that's uh, basically the rest of your, your case is, is part of that. That I think that there, there's no evidence for that yet, but I think it, it's basically a, a version of that account. One thing we should do, we have a question from our uh, audience here. So how, if at all, does decision-making change when we make choices that primarily impact others rather than ourselves? <laughs> Is there any evidence that's more or less rational? Many of the recent COVID decisions that people have been forced to make involve potentially putting friends and family at risk. This is something that you both nice have already been hitting on, who may be more at risk than the decision-makers or less at risk, but we still tend to, uh, for some people in our lives, have a really generous <laughs> estimation of their risk. Uh, so answer that in five words or less. <laughs> no. <laughs> in economic, I will tell you in economics, we have like a very, like we, we just like, we just put a, an alpha on the other people and it's less than one. 
And that's it. It's just like you care about yourself one and you care about other people less than one, depending how far they are from you, you care about them even, even less. And then you can just do all the same stuff. So it's really, it's really easy. But, but Emily, <laughs> wait, 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 wait. <laughs> but if the other person is your child, isn't it great? Yeah, yeah like a child okay. is going to get like 0.75. Point, what? You know, your Wouldn't spouse gets greater? like, you get one and your child, yeah, there's like a whole, um, yeah, there's like a whole uh, field of uh, a field that is actually my um, my my husband when we first uh, when we first started dating uh, gave me on I had I needed to go on a trip and he we were in college and he gave me a paper by uh, our the person who turned out to be our advisor to read about altruism and act like an economics paper and I'm now I've blanked on the on the title I think it was by Andre Schleifer. That was like, that's like the love language, like read this paper. I don't know what the implication, like you could be an alpha of one. I don't, I don't know where, where you were, but anyway, that's a good story. Okay. I got off it. I'm sorry. I'm sure you have something more productive to say than this. <laughs> well, I don't know. I'll, I'll just say words. Um, so, I mean, I, I think it, it, it depends who the other is, of course. I think Emily got at this. So, I mean, some of the, the earliest research I did in grad school was on decisions about uh, people know the trolley problem. You know, if you just, it, um, would you allow one person to die to save some number of others? Um, and, I, you know, the, there's the, the, there are several kind of um, uh, important findings that come in. One is that people close to us, people that we're, we kind of experience as, you know, family or close others, we kind of weight more heavily. That's kind of what I said. But then the further out people get or the more abstract they get, um, the less weight we put on them. And that kind of requires, you know, attaching some kind of salience um, to that outcome. I've never been in a situation where a trolley is about to run people over, so I have to kind of envision that. I've also never been in a situation that requires empathy and compassion in a lot of kind of charity situations, but I have to kind of um, envision that. And so it, it, it creating that kind of, you know, possible future requires us to draw on whatever resources we have, like based on our own kind of close others, um, but it has limits. And so people like Paul Slovic have shown that um, if somebody is identifiable, if you kind of describe somebody as like, you know, one individual, you're more willing, to, you're willing to pay that to donate more for that person than um, multiple people um, who are identifiable or a statistic that's much larger. Um, so basically anything you can do, um, or anything that, that makes something kind of more abstract, kind of further out from you in any way, and this is related to the more general idea of psychological distance, the more abstract something is from you, the harder it is to kind of make it salient. And that's true um, in emotional reactions generally, but also true in, in, in their role in decision-making. But I think, I mean, the one thing that happened when we sort of in the, in the COVID space around these conversations is I think that in an effort to get maybe in recognition of the fact that people mostly don't actually care that much about other people, um, just like in practice, that's not, we don't get as much weight as ourselves. We tried to turn on a lot of other systems to get people to, to sort of engage in this. I mean, we do that in society all the time, but like systems around shame, you know, if you, if you like, not how would you feel emotionally if you gave somebody else COVID, but like, you need to do this because this is your responsibility. And I think that's somehow, it's a different decision. It's, it's a sort of different thing than, than kind of the, the weighing that I do with my own family. It's like, how do I want to be perceived in my society? Um, and sort of what is almost, what is my conception of self, but also like, I don't want to be, you know, like, I don't want to be the person who gives, like whose kid is the index case. You know, like there's like, there's a social shaming aspect of this that I think we turned on, we turned on a lot of cases, we definitely turned on here that I think is, is in some ways just a, a different piece of the puzzle. Yeah, I totally agree that the part of this is like public decision making versus like the, the examples I gave were like charities, like private decisions. I think that the, the, the publicness of this is almost more important than, than how people are estimating think, this themselves. I think that's why the masks, I think that's the other reason the masks have become such a, because, because they're so public, right? In a way that like your vaccination status is not public, that this is a way to kind of signal other things about your, your behavior to a broader, uh, to a broader set of people. And since, you know, that's a, that's a kind of a value. Yeah, one, one thing that maybe dovetails with that in a lot of the polarization around the masking, right, is in the topic of fatigue of decision making, it, it's so much easier to increasingly disregard the value of those distant alphas, those mini alphas or mm -hmm. fractions of alpha or whatever. Um, 
when we're already fatigued. It already takes a lot of work to try and have a theory of mind of what is someone not like us, whatever not like us means, going to make in their choices and we don't have good intuitions about it. It gets even easier to be devaluing of them, unfortunately. And I think that's that's led to a lot of the the extremity of the way people are coming down in these debates or these thoughtfulnesses about masks, maybe. Or about anything, right? I mean, you know, there it's like we don't, yeah, it's hard to hard to keep all those things in your head. We just had this really great discussion about the, you know, the at least the just very um in this moment, the impact of of the of COVID and all of this exhausting decision making that has to be done. Um, and um, but I, I just kind of want want to now perhaps shift the conversation. We only have like eight minutes left, less <laughs> so the closest amazing. But to think about like what mitigating, perhaps for want of a better word, some um, irrational, maybe not quite balanced decision making. <laughs> Like, how do you, how do you think through that? And of course, I know a lot of what you write about Emily is really, I think, giving giving a structure to decision making. But but maybe if you could say a little bit about how you think about m mitigating what might be some, you know, putting yeah. trying to find the right weighting of all of the different decisions that one is making. Yeah, I mean, I would almost say that that like the way I think about this is kind of to try to like like explain to people how they can explicitly do the marbles, right? And so, you know, your brain, like just to, to try to, to give people a framework for making, for making decisions that allows them to access more of the kind of cognitive control pieces and without as many of the emotional control pieces. And I think, you know, I draw a lot of parallels with like decision-making in our job where we tend to have, not always, but there we tend to have sort of fewer like emotions that come that come out, and I think when we when we make decisions in our in our lives, it tends it's it's more likely that there's an emotional overtone of everything. And I mean, I guess maybe the parallel there is that like that that emotional overtone is also expensive. It's also cognitively expensive. And then if I could just say, you know, what actually this problem doesn't necessarily need an emotional overtone. It needs to like I need to get the following kinds of facts and like put them together and and weigh them and explicitly weigh them that that's kind of a way into some of this, into some of this decision making. So I almost think it's just like a formalization of, of it's just formalization. I'm gonna tell you, like, as you hear that, is there, does that map onto your work um, as you're kind of thinking about like the effort <laughs> um, measuring, uh, you know, how much effort is it gonna cost me in order to make these decisions? And somehow like that, that effort is decreasing by applying, uh, you know, a regular framework, trying to eliminate emotional decisions. Not that we can do it, of course, completely. But it, does that map onto onto your research? And I, I also want to kind of flip back again to Emily to ask if whether any any of the brain science <laughs> that you know, which I'm sure you know some, has influenced the way in which you're thinking. So, so uh, I'm a type person. <laughs> so I'll just say a few words, which is, I, I think that uh, there's a number of ways that you can kind of change people's decision making. I think that the suggestions Emily makes are, are really excellent. I think, I don't know if you can get people to kind of turn off their emotions, but I think if you can um, channel them. Um, and I think if, if you can externalize what Emily's describing, I think one of the problems is that we don't really have like a guide, like we do have like, you know, for restaurant ratings or something like that. Like you can go and like, I, you know, I read Emily's newsletter and others to kind of like get a sense of like, what would be the best kind of like policy in this kind of place. But if we had like a heat map of like, I'm surprised that there's nothing really out there as far as I know, like where, where's the highest prevalence or, you know, kind of like tracing back like um, cases to where they most likely happened and kind of like a heat map like that, like that would be able like then people could then say like I'm going to feel bad in this area and I'm going to feel better in this area um, and that you know doesn't remove the the affective component but at least kind of creates like a you know color map for them um, that they can kind of you know channel into, into their decision making. Yeah I mean I think you have identified what I think is like among the many very significant data data failures of the pandemic which is like we have not enough contact tracing to have any idea where anybody gets COVID right and so like we don't like we just have no idea. And so like people are like, how many people have COVID a playground? No idea, probably zero, but it's definitely no idea. How many people get a sleepover? Who knows? Nobody did any of this, 
So we have like kind of no ability to make those kind of specific um, specific instructions. But um, but yeah, I mean, on the on the like brain science stuff. I mean, I think um, sort of all, all the time about like brain science and how I can try to like help people try to like use bastardizations of brain science to, to like tell people how they should make their brain work uh, more like models of the brain. <laughs> I don't think I do a good job of it. Um, I don't know. That's, that's my, yeah. That, that's completely fair. <laughs> um, so I, we're actually getting close to closing, um, but that there is a question that just came in. And so um, I'll read it and maybe Chris, you could think of a few closing <laughs> comments that you wanna make um, while we get, get through this. Um, so the question is the following, are there specific decision spheres that are more likely than others to drive emotional decision-making? So more likely might equal money and kids and health and less likely might equal restaurants, directions, outfit, outfit. Um, are our heat maps largely alike or highly personal? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there are definitely areas that people have, um, I, you know, I think there are definitely areas in which people have more emotional decision-making. I almost would frame it like I think that there are that things that happen that have to do with like liking, like in your house that have to do with like loving each other uh, are really problematic because it's like, we sort of think we should be able to move through them because we like we like each other um, or because like we're sort of like, we, sh we expect to be aligned. Um, and I think kids, that comes up with kids a lot. Like I don't expect to have conflict about what our kids should do because like we all are like a family and we all love each other. And like, why would we have to talk, you know, talk those things through, whereas like, I would expect to occasionally have conflict about whether we want to eat sushi or, or like barbecue. And that's like a conflict that I'm, that I don't see as much as a conflict. So I think some of that is just about like how, you know, how, how much, or not, like how much, yeah, how much emotional balance there is. Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to fall on the, the side of, uh, I, I think most decisions that we call like value-based decisions are based on emotion or affect in some way. I mean, when we're talking, thinking about even sushi, like we're thinking about what is our like affective experience of that. So I think part of the question is what is the kind of emotion that it evokes and, and how strongly. And I think there's kind of one other piece of this, which is that, that broadly speaking, there's kind of two ways in which emotions affect decision-making in, intentionally and unintentionally. And so we can kind of direct our search of, you know, those marbles towards the things that we kind of like care about by deciding like, this is how much I like the sushi or this, how badly I imagine this potential risk. And then there's, all of the other kind of emotions that sometimes come up when I'm just thinking about this thing, when I'm thinking about my kids, there's all sorts of other kind of you know, emotional elements that kind of might come in and affect my decision in a way that I, I may not intend. Um, so I don't know if that answers that question, but it's at least another piece of my mind. Both of you, like as, as uh, I mean, time perception is one thing that's uh, unfortunately uh, poorly correlated uh, with a rational estimation of the amount of information content so if something's really pleasurable, time flies. And so it's been an hour. <laughs> I know it feels like 10 minutes, <laughs> but, but directly in proportion to our enjoyment, we've, mis you know, we've underestimated how long the time is going. Uh, this is a really garbled way of saying how, how great this has been to, to talk with you both. Um, I, I mean, really great. I, I, I do think that, you know, especially on these like, either it's gonna be sad or it's gonna be anxious. <laughs> Emily, when you were posing that before, Maybe that's why people are going down College Hill on scooters. It, like, it matters to make a choice. Well, that's because they're 20, Chris. That's because they're 20. That's why they're going down College Hill on scooters. That's not please, because- Please tell me it's okay for both an economist and a cognitive neuroscientist <laughs> to make that choice, please. <laughs> All right, and then you- No, don't, I'm not saying that we should make that choice. I'm just saying it's because they're 20. You went down the hill on a scooter when you were 22. Maybe not you. I, pro I probably did. Probably, I, I probably, probably did worse. <laughs> yeah, can't remember, but but this is say. that's because of the yeah. <laughs> to all the twenty-year-olds watching this right now, we're not ascribing any motives. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. What about multiples of twenty exactly? This is this is really great. Like it really did feel like the hour took just like a moment. But this conversation is really, really, and, and not, not only great from an intellectual point of view, but I think really useful to people uh, and understanding where the you know the pressure points are and. 
that it's just part of how the brain works and how the mind works and the, the, these aren't you know it, it makes sense that uh, the NPR poll is turning out the way it does uh, so thank you thank you both very much for thank for you that. thank you it's been a pleasure yeah thank you both and thanks everyone for listening and th there will be um, this this is recorded and it will be available on our website and so like you should go check it out and check out the other Connie conversations but thank you both it was really really delightful <laughs>